Welcome to Life Devotions, and thank you for joining me today. What shall I pray for is the title of this devotion. You know, the scripture tells us when it comes to our own being perfected and all that God's predestined us in Christ, that we don't always know what to pray because it's not yet made manifest what we shall be when we see him and will become like him. But the Holy Spirit knows that God has predestined us to be conformed to his son. And the Holy Spirit yearns in us with hunger feelings, groanings that we don't know how to express. And God who searches the heart knows what the Holy Spirit is yearning to bring us into that image of God and works it all together for good. We read this in Romans 8, 24, 25 through 29. So listen, dear friends, we don't always know what to pray, but the Holy Spirit, oh, he's such a marvelous helper when it comes to prayer. He knows the will of our Father. He is the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father. He unveils in us all that God has for us in Christ. The Holy Spirit is a master prayer and he lives in the prayer realm and is the prayer realm of Jesus in the Father and the Father in Jesus. And we're brought into that prayer realm of the glory of God to be brought into a life of prayer that is the perfect fellowship with the Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Oh my friends, prayer is one of the highest marvels in the Christian life that God is drawing us into. What shall I pray? 1 John 5, 16. If anyone sees his brother sinning, a sin which does not lead to death, he will ask, pray, and he will give him life for those committing sin not leading to death. There is sin leading to death, and I do not say he should pray about that. So what should we pray? And so I want to take you starting today in this subject, which I think is very important for us to grow in, to 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 16 and 17. Yet if anyone suffers, no, verse 17 and 18, sorry. For the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? Now, if the righteous one is scarcely saved, where will the ungodly and the sinner appear? So, my dear friends, God comes to his house consistently. He dwells in us and among us we dwell in him. And he shows us things that aren't holy, righteous and true in his sight and seeks to help us turn away from those things and by the Spirit and the blood obtain a conscience clear from sin and sensitive to do the will of the Father in the love that Christ perfects in us. Yes? And then if we go to Proverbs, okay? What shall we pray? Okay, we're going to Proverbs chapter 24. Mm. Here it is, Proverbs. to 24, verse 11 and 12, and then 17 and 18. Deliver those who are drawn towards death. Hold back those stumbling to the slaughter. If you say, surely we did not know this, does not he who weighs the hearts consider it? Now, when I read this verse a long time ago, it struck me to the core because our human earth nature can sometimes be so indifferent and idle spiritually, idle as in lazy, in helping our brothers and sisters in their walk with God. It is so important to keep a tender conscience before the Lord. Meditate on Philippians 2, verse 12 and 13. To maintain a tender conscience before the Lord. That when one among us is suffering because of failings and shortcomings of the flesh and the sin and the temptations of the world. That there is a spirit of, of, of forgiveness. I've talked about this week. A spirit of reconciliation in us that causes us to minister to one another forgiveness. And he says, deliver those drawn towards death. Hold 
back those stumbling to the slaughter. If you say, surely I didn't know this, does not he always the hearts know? If you would say, oh, well, I didn't know they were about to go make a terrible mistake. I didn't know they were about to go the wrong direction. Doesn't God know your heart and know you if you knew it or not? That, that's what came to me when I read this Robert. God knows when you were aware of their struggle and you didn't do anything about it. You didn't try to help them. You didn't reach out a hand of mercy. You didn't reach out a hand of forgiveness and grace to them. You didn't reach out a hand of comfort to them. My, did that scared me that I would be indifferent to the struggles of others and not be there for them if that's what the Holy Spirit's providing for me. Do not rejoice, listen up, verse 17, when your enemy falls. Do not let your heart be glad when he stumbles, lest the Lord see it and it displease him and he turn away his wrath from him. Never kind of, well, he had it coming. I knew what he was doing was wrong and look now, they've reaped the con. That is such an ugly pride. It's really ugly when we're like that. And I pray, God forbid, that you and I would ever have such a spirit about us that we mock the failings and fallings and hurts of others. No, the opposite. God would give us a heart that is moved for them and loves them. I read another scripture here in the book of Job, chapter 6, that is within this mindset, right? The title is, What Shall We Pray? When somebody is about to really go through it, we should be praying for them and praying for them and really believe in God and also do whatever part we may play in their salvation. But listen to this. Job chapter 6 verse 14. To him who is about to faint and despair, kindness is due from his friend, lest he forsake the fear of the Almighty. You, my brethren, have dealt deceitfully as a brook, as a channel of brooks that passes away. And he goes on, but then he says in verse 21, Now to me you are like a dried up brook. You see my dismay and terror, and believe me to be the victim of God's anger. You are afraid to sympathize with me. Now, to him who is about to faint and despair, kindness is due from a friend, lest he forsake the fear of the Almighty. Now to you, he says, you see my dismay and terror, and believe me to be the victim of God's anger, and afraid to sympathize with me. You know, I've experienced it a few times, that the Lord granted me the privilege to connect with somebody who was willfully drawn towards death, stumbling to the slaughter, as I read to you verse 11 of Proverbs 24. And it was the Lord himself who taught me his love. It came out of me towards them and I said, I love you, and when I said it, they felt the Holy Spirit pouring that love in their hearts. As we read in Romans 5.5, 5, for those who are sinners, who are ungodly, and who are enemies. You read it, those three, they're Romans 5. And I, f I said, I love you. And the man who was doing wrong, terribly wrong, and causing pain and grief to those who were suffering his wrong ways, he said, how can you say you love me? And the scripture came to my spirit from Philippians 1 verse 8. I said, the love I feel for you comes straight from the heart of Jesus. So how can I say, how can I not say I love you? And in his sinning and in his evil way that caused so much damage, the love of God was interceding. The love of God was holding him back from the slaughter. One scripture says, maybe in Zechariah or so, that the shepherd pulled the sheep out of the mouth of the lion when all that was sticking out was an ear, an ear out of the mouth of the lion. And he saved that sheep out of the mouth of the lion. You know, God, the extent that God goes to hold us back from the slaughter, to hold us back from the horrible consequences of our sins is enormous. 
And when we say, what shall I pray for? God would have you and me in such a place of intercession, my friends, that, that we could go to the ends of, of intercession. I one time, uh, uh, I knew of a, of a son that was really doing wrong, terribly wrong, and, and, and behaving in a vile manner, and I just happened to know this. And the mother of that son was sitting next to me, and she got a phone call about her son's vile, vile behavior. And I heard her happening to sit next to her, her prayer to God for her son. When I heard that mother's prayer for her terribly sinning and vow son, it struck me to the core of my being. And I said, Father, I want to know this intercession because it's like Jesus on the cross praying, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they do. And how God would love you and me to come into a place of intimacy with him that he can employ us to intercede on behalf of those who are about to be destroyed by their own ways and about the forces of darkness and sin. How God wants to employ you and me. Jeremiah in chapter 7 verse 1 <laughs> The word came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, Stand in the gate of the Lord's house and proclaim there the, this word and say, Hear the word of the Lord, all you of Judah who enter in these gates and worship the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, amend your ways and your doings and I will cause you to dwell in this place. Do not trust in these lying, in these lying words saying, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord are these. <laughs> For if you thoroughly amend your ways and your doings, if you thoroughly execute judgment between man and his neighbor, if you do not oppress the stranger, the fatherless, the widow, and do not shed innocent blood in this place, or walk after the gods, to your after other gods to your hurt, then I will cause you to dwell to dwell in this place in the land that I gave to your fathers forever and ever. Behold, you trust in lying words that cannot prof profit. Will you steal, murder, commit adultery, swear falsely, burn incense to Baal, walk after other gods whom you do not know, and then come and stand before me in the house, in this house which is called by my name, and say, we are delivered to do all these abominations? Has this house which is called by my name become a den of thieves in your eyes. Behold, I, even I have seen it, says the Lord. But go now to my place, which was <clears throat> at Shiloh, where I set my name at first, and see what I did to it because of the wickedness of my people Israel. And now, because you have done all these works, says the Lord, and I spoke to you, rising early and speaking, but you do not hear, and I called you, but you do not answer. <coughs> Therefore, I will do to the house which is called by name, my name, in which you trust to this place which I gave to you and your fathers as I have done to Shiloh. And he just keeps interceding to say, it's not enough to come into my house and say, oh, the house of God, the house of God, but live a life that is so ungodly and unholy and unclean. So let me close with you. It's a bit strong what I'm gonna to read to you next, but I think it's important for you to hear because you may say, well, Pastor Robert, you're reading Old Testament stuff, you know, and we're in the New Testament now. Well, let me read to you New Testament here, okay? Holiness and the fear of God hasn't changed from the Old to the New Testament, folks. God is the same God of the Old as he is in the New. Now listen. <coughs> But there, this is 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1. But there were also false prophets among the people. I read to you from Jeremiah chapter 7. Even as there will be false teachers among you <clears throat> who secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who bought them and bring on themselves swift destruction. And many will follow their destructive ways because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemed. 
by covetousness they will exploit you with deceptive words for a long time their judgment has not been idle and their destruction does not slumber in other words they are greedy for people's money and they don't really love them and they are bad examples and you're following their example these false teachers now if god did not spare the angels who sinned but cast them down to hell and delivered them to the chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment and did not spare the ancient world but saved Noah, one of the eight people, a preacher of righteousness bringing in the flood on the world of all the ungodly and turned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemning them to destruction, making them an example to those who afterwards would be ungodly and delivered righteous lot who was oppressed by the filthy conduct of the wicked. For that righteous man dwelling among them tormented his righteous soul from day to day by seeing and hearing their lawless deeds. Then the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptation and to reserve the unjust under punishment for the day of judgment, and especially those who walk according to the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise authority, their presumptuous self-will, they're not afraid to speak evil of dignitaries, whereas angels who are greater in power and might do not bring in a reviling accusation before them before the Lord. But these, like natural brute beasts made to be caught and destroyed, speak evil of things they do not understand and will utterly perish in their own corruption and will receive the wages of unrighteousness and those who count it a pleasure to carouse in the daytime their spots and blemishes carousing in their own deception while they feast with you having eyes full of adultery and cannot cease from sin enticing un unstable souls they have a heart trained to cover these practices and are cursed children they're forsake they have forsaken the right way and gone astray, following the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness, but he was rebuked for his iniquity, a dumb donkey speaking with a man's voice, restraining the madness of the prophet. These are wells without water, clouds carried by the tempest, for whom is reserved blackness and darkness forever. For when they speak great swelling words of emptiness, they allure through the lust of the flesh, through lewdness, open uncleanness, the ones having actually escaped from those who live in error. While they promise them liberty, they themselves are slaves of corruption for birth. For by whom a person is overcome, by him he is also brought into bondage. For if after they have escaped the pollution of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome. The latter end is worse in them than the beginning, for it would have been better for them to not have known the way of righteousness than have known it turned from the holy commandment and delivered to them. But it happened to them according to the truth tro proverb, a dog returned to his vomit as so having washed wallows in the mire. So Peter, <coughs> It's it right between the eyes that we may not, my dear friends, ever allow sin to just get an upper hand, uncleanness, unholiness, unrighteousness, ungodliness. We must live in a place of intercession before the Father to live holy by His Spirit and blood day and night washing us and keeping us clean and interceding for one another and that we stay far away from ungodliness, ungodliness and uncleanness. The Lord says, touch no unclean thing, be separate, says the Lord, and I will be a father to you and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord in 1 Peter 6. And I charge you in the Lord. Let us be in such a place of intercession and prayer that we know what to pray for and that we don't allow sin. I'll close with this little story. A long, long time ago, there was a believer who sinned, and I became aware of it. And I began to pray, Father, have mercy. Father, have mercy. I begin to pray, like I've been talking to you this week. We know how to pray, because we ourselves have been forgiven. And I begin to pray and pray and pray. <laughs> Then the opportunity came, me being the pastor, that the Holy Spirit gave to meet with the person. And the person 
was hardened by that sin, according to Hebrews 3, and, and would not open up about it and, and, and acted like it wasn't true. And I'll never forget it. Oh, how I wept and wept before the Lord and wept and wept before the Lord and prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed. And, prayed. and then after a few days of this, I was sitting in my sofa praying and I had a revelation. On one side, I saw the law of God that condemned the behavior. On the other side, I saw the cross of Jesus Christ to intercede for the transgressor. And these two forces were coming together in me. On one side, there was the law condemning the sin. On the other side, the intercession of Christ on the cross to bring forgiveness for the sin. And I so wept as this revelation came. And then I met with the person and the spirit of mercy came from the throne of grace to grant that person an escape from the snare of Satan. And may I close with this verse that is so dear to my heart and I seek it to be revealed in me daily that I know how to pray when I meet with the failings of others. <laughs> Listen to this. This is Hebrews 2, 17, 18. It is evident that it was essential that he, Jesus, be made like his brethren in every respect in order that he might become a merciful, sympathetic, and faithful high priest in things relating to God to make atonement and propitiation for the sins of the people. For because he himself in his Humanity has suffered in being tempted, tested, and tried. He is able immediately to run to the crisis, relieve those who are being tempted, tested, and tried, and who therefore are being exposed to suffering. Chapter 4, this is my last verse, and I'm finished. Verse 15 and 16 of Hebrews. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to understand and sympathize and have a shared feeling with our weaknesses, infirmities, and liabilities to the assault of temptation, but one who was tempted in every respect as we are yet without sinning. Let us then fearlessly, confidently, and boldly draw near to the throne of grace, the throne of God's unmerited favor for us sinners, that we may receive mercy for our failures and find grace to help in good time for every need, appropriate help, well-timed help, coming just as we need it. Oh, that we may know how to pray within this high priestly grace of Jesus and see the church kept holy and clean and washed continuously by the blood of the Holy Spirit so that the Lord may use the church to restrain evil in the community and bring forth the wonderful way of mercy and hope for every person to be saved. God does not want any man to go lost, but he wants all men to come to the knowledge of the truth that there is but one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for many. Amen. Have a good day.